And hi, everybody. Um, I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns, and I am executive director at All Brains Belong. Welcome to Brain Club. Let me share screen. Get us oriented. So tonight we will be discussing the language of belonging. One of the things that we try to do here at Brain Club is to provide one another with language to better understand our own experiences and the experiences of other people. Um, and uh, as, as we'll hear from several of our community members in our pre-recorded panel, um, what the impact of acquiring language um, to understand their world has been like for them. Um, brain Club, of course, is our community conversation about everyday brain life. Um, it's our very intentionally created education space. Um, Sarah, are you letting people in so I can stop looking at the things popping up? Yes, I am letting people awesome. in. Th thank you, amazing. Culture of interdependence. I have the kind of brain that when the things pop up, I, I can no longer read. So anyway, um, our intentionally created education space to provide education about neurodiversity and related topics of inclusion. Um, this is not medical advice or mental health advice. It's also not a support group. Auburn's Belong does offer those services, but this is not, this is not those. Um, um, this is also not to the debate philosophy or view of the world, which is that um, that all brains belong, our view of the world is that there is no one correct type of brain or body. Um, and uh, part of queuing safety, um, in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, um, is that we are really intentional about language and very intentional about um, the language that um, that is used to cue safety so that all people feel feel safe. Um, and so collective access needs taking priority over that of the individual in, in that regard, um, because we're really trying to create a space where people can collectively learn and unlearn. It's a, place, it's a place where we want all people to feel safe and where they can experience something different from the quote outside world. Um, and so um, we very intentionally facilitate Brain Club in order to cue safety for all people. All forms of participation are okay here at Brain Club. As many of you have figured out, you can have your video on or off. And even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. We certainly don't need you to sit still or make eye contact or any of those things. Please feel free to walk and move and fidget and stim and eat and take breaks and all the things and everyone's welcome. Um, and, you know, uh, observation is a completely valid form of participation, um, but we also do want to intentionally create space for everyone to share their ideas in whatever way that looks like and in whatever format that looks like. So you can unmute and use mouth words. Um, as I mentioned before, there will be a period of today where there's a pre-recorded um, set of interviews. Um, so during that time, we will um, uh, we'll have the chat box running. Sometimes the chat box moves pretty quickly, um, but the the main idea is the is 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 the interview um, uh, will be shown on the screen, um, and that um, uh, afterwards we'll have plenty of time for discussion. All right, last bit of access. Um, closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. So depending on your version of Zoom, you might see the live transcript closed captioning icon, but if not, look for the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles. You can do the same and choose hide subtitles if you want to turn them off. And that's my visual support to actually open the chat so that I will see it if um, anybody's using it. Um, you're also welcome to send me um, direct messages, private messages, um, if there's anything that you need. All right, um, so this month we have been, we're continuing our conversation of health and belonging. All Brains Belong supports the health and belonging of people with all types of brains. And so as we, um, last week, last week we had an amazing um, uh, set of community panelists sharing their vision for inclusion. Um, and uh, today we'll, we'll continue that conversation with the, 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 the way in which language, having language to understand one's experience um, influences um, one's experiences. 
and um, why why we are doing this is because what we know is that many people in our community do not feel that they belong. What we know is that neurodivergent people are more likely to struggle to access healthcare, education, employment, and to experience social isolation. We know that autistic and ADHD adults die prematurely and throughout our lives often feel alone and broken. What we also know is that social isolation is bad for health. Social isolation causes equivalent harm to health as much as smoking 15 cigarettes per day. And neurodivergent people experience higher rates of negative social experiences um, and, as I said, experience high rates of social isolation and loneliness. And so here at All Brains Belong, um, you know, with the support of our, you know, our, our, our village members, our supporters, our, you know, this co-created community health village, um, where people who perhaps have felt neglected, misunderstood by the system, um, can show up as their true selves and experience genuine belonging. And in so doing, have the opportunity to shift one's own narrative about their own lives through connection with other people and having experiences reflected back to you in learning about the experiences of other people at Brain Club is, is one of the ways we try to create that experience. Because we think this is part of health. Um, you know, at All Brains Belong, we integrate medical care into social connection and employment support and helping people arrive at a deep understanding of their access needs um, because it's all part of health. Healthcare is so much more than medical care. And so we're very excited that today um, we officially kicked off our Did You Know This Could Be Healthcare campaign, um, which has two goals. Um, one is to spread awareness of ABB's resources, inviting people to learn and connect. Um, and, uh, and and to expand access to eight of these programs. Um, and we're really excited that um, just two weeks in, um, we're almost halfway there. Um, and uh, thanks to um, a gift from an anonymous supporter, um, uh, we have the opportunity to be able to offer all of our community programs um, like Brain Club um, at no cost to participants through next year, we hit our goal. Um, part of this campaign, um, is also um, a celebration event. We have a virtual New Year's Eve event coming up. Um, it's uh, free or by donation, um, where we'll have lots of lots of different ways to celebrate and come together as community. And so with that, the language of belonging. David, take it away. One of the gifts that All Brains Belong has given to me, and I think so many other people, is, is a common language based on common experience that we didn't know existed before. And when we can see ourselves reflected in the stories of other people, we become more okay with ourselves. Smoothing out the rough edges of my experiences and of my perceptions I'm less harsh on myself. I'm less sharp with myself. Right? It's exposing me to people being so beautifully raw and authentic because the space allows that. And I can't think of many spaces in life that allow for people to, um, to come together in this way and kind of like this radical act of trust. Which then gives you know, us the opportunity to learn from each other's experiences and to really value and feel valued by each other and feel a lot less alone and a lot more hopeful. And so it ends up feeling like a community more than a medical practice. What do you mean healthcare can be like this? You like to say, it's all the things. <laughs> and this is like, yeah, you know, there are two words and people are like, oh yeah, I get it. That's it. And I feel like that's just one example of some of the language that Brain Club has given me to talk about things like my family uses so many words and like my kids talk about flipping their lids and they they can do hand gestures when they can't articulate it with words. And, and it's just like all these, like there's a, there's a shared language 
that the language is just like the top surface level of what really is shared, like it's rooted deeply in a shared understanding of the world. But just having those words, it's so powerful to have words to share that experience. We have to give people language to talk about these things because they yeah. are universal. And yet we didn't grow up with any language to understand these things, name these things, experience these things, um, work with these things. Yeah. Yeah. And I think language can be like underestimated. Like people think like it's just words. And, but I think when you don't have the words for something, when you get the words, like it's, I think it, it just, it makes things feel okay when you have words to say what they are. Like it, I don't know, it makes them feel shared and connected and not so alone and isolated when you don't have words to describe them. Oh, there's things that, that make us stress that are going to differ person to person and like context specific. Like if there's something in the physical environment, like a loud sound, if I'm like well hydrated and well rested, I might not be as stressed as if I'm, you know, haven't done those things or have like a huge cognitive load or whatever, like with this business of the zoom and the link and the whatever and all the switching between things. If, if a motorcycle drives by my house right now, I'm going to flip my lid where it's like I might have been okay a couple hours ago. So um, when we get triggered when and borrowing from a um, a model from Dr. Dan Siegel, Dr. Tina Green Bryson uh, from the whole brain child, upstairs brain and downstairs brain, when downstairs brain gets triggered, we don't get to pick what triggers us. And sometimes we forget that there that we have interpersonal access needs. It's not just about sensory processing or like how we learn. It's 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 about access needs in a relationship. What does it mean for downstairs brain to feel safe? And so um when we think about, since we all have access needs, often those access needs conflict with other people. And I might play this clip. I might just come back to it. Well, maybe. It depends on if I can just unshare and reshare. There you go. I got to share this sound. It's not going to work. Please. Mm. Oh, we can invite all 12 of your brothers what? to stay no. with us. No, 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 no. Of course we have the room. Just I don't wait. know some of them. Wait, slow must... down. No one's brothers are staying here. No one is getting married. Wait, what? May I talk to you, please? Alone? No. Whatever you have to say, you, you can say to both of us. Fine. You can't marry a man you just met. You can if it's true love. Anna, what do you know about true love? Well, more than you. All you know is how to shut people out. You asked for my blessing, but my answer is no. Now, excuse me. Your Majesty, if I may ease no, your- No, you may not, and I, th I think you should go. The party is over. Close the gates. Yes, Your Majesty. Elsa, no, no, wait. Give me my glove. Elsa, please, please. I can't live like this anymore. Then leave. What did I ever do to you? Enough, Anna. No, why? Why do you shut me out? What, why do you shut the world out? What are you so afraid of? I said enough! So, um, here we have a relationship with two people with access needs. One is looking to assert them by taking space. One has foot on the gas with an access need to communicate right here and now. Boom, that didn't work out so well. I'm curious, anybody else ever experienced conflicting access needs in an interpersonal interaction? Get some nods. Relationships are hard. Hi, Matthew, are you? Are you um, are, are, are you raising your hand to say, yes, I have conflicting access needs in interpersonal interactions, or did you want to say something? Yes, Mel, Mel, yes, 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 du double yes, you know, <laughs> yes, Con conflicting access needs, but also 
trying to interpret those needs in a way where the other party makes sense, can understand you too as well. It's just, it goes both ways. Huh, we might look pretty similar. Um, and then once we were getting a, a comfy blanket from Costco and they have like two types of super soft blankets. And for some reason, one of them was really comfortable to me and the other one was really comfortable to him. And so we're having this fight over how do we cuddle on the couch with the blanket is, is kind of like our first access needs. And I'm getting frustrated with him for not accepting my blanket. And eventually it dawned on me that we were both just as like we were the same, but it, but it's very real. Like my soft blanket is prickly to him, his words, you know, and his soft blanket, I can say, yeah, it's soft, but it doesn't make me feel good. The biggest, most important things for me has been coming to see both my child's brain and my brain through, um, a strengths-based lens, yeah. like, you know, like really focusing on the amazing strengths and benefits of having a neurodivergent brain um, and utilizing those and building those and honoring those and um, and celebrating those rather than, than focusing on what's wrong. So do you talk about access needs, sensory needs, et cetera? Like, do you talk about that explicitly with your kids? I try to. I'm still learning how to do that. Yeah. But yes, you know, I, I do. I talk about, you know, well, if they want the lights on, you know, maybe we'll turn them on, but usually they're fine with it, you know, and, and sound like, you know, I'll just, I, I just try to find the right way to say, you know, if, if it's okay to be loud, because sometimes I'm loud too, I can't really regulate my voice volume, but it needs to be like more farther apart for me because sure. it's hurting me. Because yes. it, it actually hurts, you know, if you're screaming, and not, not, I'm not talking like screaming in fear or pain or something, I'm just like kids just like to scream. You know? Right, sure, sure. Right, I mean, you're you're really, you're teaching them about conflicting access needs. I think if all humans understood conflicting access needs, we would have oh a lot gosh, less yeah. chaos in the world. I think being in a neuro mixed family there is this ableist assumption that like neurodivergent folks have access needs and neurotypical folks don't and i think just coming to an understanding of you have needs i have needs all of our needs are valid and recognizing my own has helped me not i hope i think not not make my other people in my life feel so othered by their needs, by kind of owning mine and using that as a communication tool to talk about mine and talk about theirs. And I think it helps me not place blame on one person for their needs um, to kind of recognize what my own are. And I think that's been really helpful in reshaping the way that I think about my family and the way that I think about like the needs of each person in my family as being all important and all priorities and all equal in what they are but i think when you only name the needs of one or two people in your family it automatically creates tears and i think having words for access needs and starting to know what those are a helps them be met and b helps make me better at meeting other people's needs people who were supposed to feel familiar never did mm -hmm. and then that's what that contrast is what made me feel inadequate and like, there's mm -hmm. something wrong with me that I'm uncomfortable around you, even though like, really, it's because you're an unsafe bucket person. But yep. I didn't have language to describe that. Mm -hmm. I was just like, mm -hmm. oh, what's wrong with me? I can't get along with the people. I feel so uncomfortable. I don't know what to say. And so the fact that I'm sort of like understanding the importance of safety as a need for me now at this point in my life is really allowing me to take some risks and trust some people and try to figure out what is the more authentic for me just by understanding what the scope of safety is it's like if i consciously think about it it makes it easier and then i don't get upset with myself for why did i do that 
you know? Right. Cause I'm just like, I'm, I'm such a loser who like can't do the birthday party thing. Yeah. Cause it's like, that's the old narrative. That's like, yeah, the exactly. Of an unrecognized exactly. neurodivergent person. That's like what we tell ourselves all the time. I could actually go to, you know, like a cocktail party. And if mm -hmm. no one knew anyone, I was yep. fine. Yep. Everything else, not fine. So not <laughs> yep. fine. Too clicky. Um, too clicky, right. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting because I see that pattern playing out for Luna already as a kindergartner. Mm -hmm. When she sees that the other kids are familiar and she doesn't mm -hmm. like, she, she doesn't feel like she is on the in-group, right? And so, yeah. So, so she, yeah, that, that idea, that whole scaffolding piece, the, the, the gap she can't navigate. She can't navigate the gap, right? Yeah, yeah. But if there's like, a, if there's like an adult who is, facilitating you know mm -hmm. being a, like a central figure who's facilitating a game where everyone has a yep. role and the expectations are clear um and yep. it's it, like there's some structure to it like that's fine mm -hmm. she'll play those games yeah the research says that the opposite of belonging is fitting in because you are changing yourself to fit the norms of the already established group and what i realize now is I spent my whole life trying to fit in to belong. But when I'm fitting in, I don't get to be myself. I get to be like the version of the outside world and how much anxiety that has cost me um, and how exhausted I am. We're all in this together as individuals that, you know, that sees things differently, hears things differently, moves things differently. To be in a community where I get to explore and learn about my brain and other people and other people's brains. Extremely socially isolated. My world is a four block radius pretty much. And so I would like to say that I think the most, one thing that's been really important to me is I'm not tired after brain club. I'm actually revived, like it's refreshing because it's easy to be there. So to find something that is engaging and fun and interesting but doesn't exhaust me doesn't doesn't tire me period like not at all it gives me spoons if anything you know and forks and some knives and a ladle <laughs> for i would say honestly the other patients like it's really nice like there's never a sense of oh i feel weird contributing or i feel like the odd one there's always a sense of belonging even if we don't know each other because we all know realistically we're here for like similar things adjacent things because really it kind of is all the things your body is not just one system you know independent from another it's one very interesting very cool but very finicky machine so I'm going to share some quotes um, from another uh, community member. Ground rules. There's something very reassuring about that way of grounding us each time as we begin. And I think we, we heard that from several, several folks in the video. Normalizing diversity, no right way to participate. I feel liberated by being accepted as I am, say, because I'd rather respond to questions in writing or knowing that I can be fully present in a session of Brain Club without having to say anything. Reading the chat box is evidence of the heartful and mutually supportive sparklings of insight that are constantly happening, but without the spoken words that tend to dominate most group discussions. Reflections on connecting with other Brain Club participants. I learned so much from hearing other Brain Club participant stories, sometimes because I recognize in them things I experienced myself, sometimes because of just appreciating the variety of ways people can be in the world and still belong. This one. I end up more open to the wholeness of myself and others inside and outside of Brain Club. Uh, specifically related to understanding one's access needs. Like a lot of people throughout my life, I knew that many things weren't working for me. 
I never thought of this as relating to access needs, though. I thought I just had character flaws. I now see a lot of this as simply reflecting the ways a brain like mine would raggedly interact with a neurotypical world. I to say what I have found very moving here is that there are little kernels of truth that have been sprinkled throughout the panel and throughout the chat and they're just mind altering or life altering and they're like i don't know it's like looking through a crystal or something they they just make you see the world differently and thank you for that thank you to all of our panelists many of whom are here today so um as as we listened to that video, as we watched that video um there were several comments in the chat um that i think in the thing and i think um i'm, I'm going to start with xander um uh barriers to people in wheelchairs curbs and stairs for us autistic folks are curbs of a lack of vocabulary to describe our lives yeah yeah I'd love to open this up to discussion about what it has been like to acquire words or ways of thinking about your own experiences that, and what that's been like. Ellie. So I had to do something um, pretty brave last week. And again, this week, I have been working on training people that I work with on kind of trying to understand some of these things more, which meant having to be honest about things that were really hard for me to talk about. And I realized how much shame I still have that I thought I had already dealt with. Um, and I think that that might be a lifelong process and it's really hard that you already have to live in a world that's not designed for you. You already have to, because I don't know about everyone else, but the way that I interact or enjoy company of others looks different. Like my engagement looks different. So I've got that. And then all of this like programming that's in my head that is really tough to get over too. Right. I mean, it's like, it's, it's, a. I think your language of like programming, it's a program. And like, so it's just, you know, this program is not meeting my needs. I, I need a new program. And that program has been running for a long time. Right. Monique. Hi. Sorry, I said moon. I said, sir, oh, I, I did actually say that out loud. I was like, oh, I never hit the mute button. Oops, the unmute button. Anyway, I'm glad I actually said that. <laughs> there was a big long pause because I had all these windows open. I'm like, shut, shut, shut. turn my audio on. So, hi, everyone. Um, boy, I am. Um, I'm, I'm really good at self advocating. I got to tell you that. But my. Um, removing the layers of internalized ableism and shame around how I have engaged with the world. And it's shame that I have assumed and shame that I've taken on. And it, it's not helpful, but I think we all experience it. But recently, just this last week, yeah, what what's time? Last week, I think I had a doctor's appointment and I haven't had a doctor's appointment in quite a while. And this is my specialist. This is my HIV specialist. And um, I could hardly speak. And this is the first time I've engaged with her since um, 
getting professional acknowledgement that yes, you are art autistic, Monique, confirming my, my decades long suspicion. So anyways, this was my first appointment and I had a hard time. It was a horrible appointment. And I, 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 it was, it was mono, on my part, monosyllabic. I was rude to my doctor that I've known for almost 30 years. A doctor I know cares for me, cares about my health. And I just, I couldn't talk about anything that was going on in my life. I couldn't talk about any of the misery. I couldn't talk about any of the struggles, any of my concerns. And I, I was just like, yes, no, I wasn't giving her any information. I wasn't expanding on anything. I was really resistant to anything she was suggesting. A lot of no. And then and I hung up the phone and I, for many days after that, I went into this shame spiral. I went into this spiral of, you know, I wanted to completely isolate myself and hide. And, and I don't, I haven't really figured out what it is, but I mean, I'm starting to surface from it now and I'm drafting a letter to send to her to tell her why I had such a hard time speaking to her and articulating my needs in that moment. And it's linked to access needs, it's linked to communication. So it's gonna be a pivot point for me. And she's still my doctor and I know she's a good skilled doctor and I know I'm a good skilled person. So there's a pivot happening right now, but boy, access needs, it's, it's like flypaper sometimes I get stuck in it and I'm like wiggling and flailing about, and I know what I need to say, but I just can't get the words out. Uh, yeah, that's a little, that's a recent experience. It's kind of poignant right now. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, all day long, I hear stories like that. Um, so you are not alone. So remember how complex spoken speech is. It's a complex motor skill. So literally you cannot speak. Like literally brain is not firing. Like as Steve says, words trapped in the head. You're, you, it's, it's, it's the idea of like, I think of what I want to say. I then sequence the ideas. Brain sends message to mouth like it moves mouth and tongue and all the articulators in a particular way. Like that's just like, it's, it's so hard. It's so complicated. We take it for granted. And so you're in a healthcare environment, you know, whether it be the lights or the ticking clock or the way someone asked a question, the ways like the judgment or like the energy or like the everything that goes on. Um, like, so when the limbic system is triggered, you're just, your cortex is taken offline. And so um, I also just like want to recognize like, you know, I was so rude, like probably, you know, like, like you, you couldn't have done any differently. You know, you're just trying to survive in that moment. And so I just, uh, what I wish for you is first off, I want, I want you to know that you're not alone. Um, I want, I, and, 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 I wish for you and I wish for everyone to when you have these moments, like, you know, I'm, and I, I forgot somebody said in the chat, like, oh, well, you know, you have to already be on a journey to like figure out your access needs in order to like talk about your access needs, which is like, I absolutely agree with that. But it, it, it's also like when something happens, if you can make or like try on the hypothesis that um, this thing happened because I didn't have my access needs met, if that's your leading hypothesis, as opposed to I'm broken, I'm messed up, I'm defective, I can't do the thing, I don't know how to talk to people, I'm a terrible person, like all those old stories, um, the story of my access needs are unmet. Amy. Um, I kind of forgot what I was going to say, but I'm starting to remember. I I think I wanted to say that um, like some days we can talk and sometimes some days we can't. And so I think sometimes we have the energy because we slept well and sometimes we didn't sleep well for multiple days. And I think that's part of it. I also wanted to recognize that um, I've noticed more recently, the more I have people who understand 
what I'm saying without having to explain it. The more that I'm just like, it's, it's sort of beyond belonging. I still think like there's a way of belonging. That's like, it's still kind of things in my old masking way. Like it requires something of me, but to have a space where it's nothing is required of me. Um, that when you go back to a space where people, I realize like how rapid I'm learning things because my whole framework has changed in the way that I'm thinking about moving in the world. And then if I go back to spaces that I haven't been in in a long time, even if I felt comfortable there at some point, it can, it can almost feel more awkward because I'm having to go back and explain ways I used to have to explain where now I have a community that I don't have to explain myself and that I have like people modeling. I just want to say Mel, like, you know, the way that you, I felt like you've modeled for me and the way that you've been able to like, even just say, how could you not feel certain ways in certain situations starts shifting that like internalized ableism um, because I feel like we have a, in a, in a, in you Mel and other folks in the community, a real role model of, of accepting oneself and showing up as oneself and that there's more permission because, because that's what you do. Thank you for naming that. Um, thank you for saying that. Um, and, and, you know, of all of the, all of the various aspects of privilege that I have, for us, the idea that I spend almost all of my time now surrounded by people who get it that's a privilege and for people who spend most of their day in invalidating environments where the narrative is given that you are broken and defective and there's something just inherently wrong with you that that impacts so much and shuts down so much and interferes with so much everything. And so um, we've talked about at Brain Club, like whenever one has the autonomy, the agency to opt out of environments that are invalidating, that is health promoting. And there are times when we don't have that. Mel, it looks like Ray has a hand up. So, so I did the thing that I said yep. I didn't do before, which is I said Ray, and I'm like, well, uh, probably I did it again, but then I remembered like I was just told that I didn't do the thing, so I did it this time anyway. So, um, Ray, <laughs> um, so I'm in the OT program, the occupational therapy program at the University of Vermont, and um, there's just a lot of conflicting things that have been happening in my program, just like very not neuro affirming, um. And like one is like, we had a presentation and eye contact was part of like, it was on the rubric and it just made me very <laughs> upset. Um, especially for an OT program, you would think that um, it would be more neuroaffirming. So I'm trying to like do my capstone related to this very topic. Um, but yeah, that was definitely a need that was just kind of not met. <laughs> yeah. Um, just like what we, we talk about at Brain Club, the idea of like learning and unlearning, um, and, um, there needs to be a lot of intentionality to unlearning things that, you know, particularly as professionals that we've been taught, um, that, that have been normalized in culture. And, you know, so like, just, um, you know, I, 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 I remember in my medical training, someone told me once that like, there was going to be this time where I could discern like, 
like, like helpful information from unhelpful information. And like, when you're early in the process, you're like, I don't know, I don't know anything. And like, and then you're like, no, that thing, that's just wrong. I'm going to opt out of that thing. And I'm going to like, anyway, so like, I think you're at this place where you know better, like you already know better and you can, you can opt out of, of things that are being presented. And it's also like super dysregulating. All of those things are true. Anyway, I'm glad you're here. Nice to see you again. Love to invite anyone who hasn't had um, a chance to share share out if you if you'd like to about what it has been like to learn that other people go through the things that you go through. Reading that, Kelly shared that um, just normalizing that her students, um, you know, what does engagement look like for me? It's like the brain rules of, you know, um, the only way to signal that you're paying attention is to like sit still with your hands folded and looking up and making like, anyway, like, nope, what does engage? So yeah. And, you know, I, I you know, as a, as a parent, I get all kinds of feedback that I have to like take and be like, they don't know. They don't know. Um, just yeah, all, all, all of that. Because I think, like Kelly, what you're describing for you know a young child to actually be able to be like, yeah, I'm just going to reject that out of hand, and you know, there's actually no one right way to signal that I am engaged with you. Sierra says, I spend so much of my day suppressing my impulse to start conversations with open-ended questions. Yes, because we were trained to ask open-ended questions. And like, especially when, um, as neurodivergent people, we tend toward, um, like we maybe are more likely to resort to, like, I, I mean, I, I'll speak to my, I'll just speak for myself. Um, so everybody's different. Um, like automatic speech, like the things that um, I don't need to motor plan out and think about. So I say the thing and it's so much easier to say that thing again. And it rolls off the tongue. It's not as active and involved as a, a different part of the brain that is plotting out novel speech. So to unlearn the language that you were taught to use as a professional and that you have said so many times that actually requires extra brain power to pause impulse control cortically override as Sierra is describing. Yeah. Because as Audrey's saying, open-ended questions make my brain freeze. So many brains freeze. Open-ended questions do not work for all brains. Questions at all don't work for all brains. Um, so, you know, declarative language, turning questions into statements, like that's not, clinicians are not taught these things. And what happens? We have experiences where People are in healthcare settings, they're, you know, so something is said or something is done um, in the environment that is also overstimulating. Oh, and by the way, all of the spoons that have been spent to even leave the house to get to that appointment and like all of it. And then somebody asks a question and you're like, of, of course the words don't come out. That's interesting. So Sierra is sharing that you noticed that as an indicator for burnout, that you are more relying on automatic speech because you're in like energy conservation mode. Yeah, that resonates with me a lot. 
Monique says, I appreciate hearing the access needs of others because it supports me in feeling less alone. So many times I declare you two. And I thought I was alone in this. Right. I mean, like, imagine if we all knew each other like decades ago, like what? Um, but that's, 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 um, you know, all of the unlearning of internalized ableism. I think like doing it in community, doing it, walking this journey with other people who are also shifting their own narrative, I think makes a huge difference. Um, Natalie says, uh, honestly, knowing there are others who experience the world similarly to me has been life-giving. I know labels have very real limitations, but they can also be amazing tools for self-compassion and empowerment. So yes, shared language has been essential. Oh, I just want to, I just want to take that in. Chills. Thank you. Oh, Audrey, I'm so glad you're here. David? The, the word that keeps coming up as I'm listening to this um, is story and the importance of story as the particular kind of language that is expressed through story. I, I had a job at one point where I spent far too much time in sort of big United Nations interagency meetings and conferences and so forth where people would talk at each other and and you mostly in kind of dead language. <laughs> and I invented my own rule of conferences, which was French's first rule of conferences, which is the larger the group, the fewer the stories are that will be told and the other way around. And one of the precious things about Brain Club is that it's small enough that I think people feel comfortable telling stories, which would be, if, if, if there were a hundred of us, there would probably be a lot few stories being, and stories are where the heart is and where the action is and where the understanding is. And there's something, I think, in, in just hearing people, I mean, everyone's talking about hearing other people's familiar experience, and that's what comes through the storytelling, and it just somehow seems very powerful tonight. Sharing that, and I absolutely agree. Um, and, you know, certainly we, and um, particularly after there are like events that we hold like in a brewing club slot, like when we did the the all the things webinar in September or when we did our annual, you know, the stigma of the autism narrative in April, like there's always this like infusion and then you're like, ah, brain club's too big. Ah! And then like it, 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 it whittles back down. And so, 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 but you're absolutely right. There is this, um, this, I mean, for many brains, um, the kind of the, the smaller group, the group of, you know, you kind of recognize some, some familiar faces and names and like, it just, it's, it's, it's about queuing safety in being able to have access to share stories, to engage with the stories of others. There's a conversation going on in the chat around processing speed. Um, so very common um, for processing speed differences in both directions um, to um, be a common reason that, um, you know, people's access needs are not met. Um, so whether that be um, processing speed such that like, you know, people like information's coming at you way too quickly, you're taking it, you're processing it, and then like the conversation's moved on or there's like so much competing stimuli from the rest of the environment, then, then, then you don't have access or, um, or, or, or even, um, if, uh, you know, like information's not coming in quickly enough because of inattention, then brain moves on to something else and then is not able to process that incoming information. So that's like on the, on the, on the, on the list of things to like, just, prompts for consideration around like really what is my, what is, what, what kind of processing do, do works best for me. Um, and so I think that, you know, yes, 
that Instagram post was like not for intro. It wasn't like intro to access needs by any means. Um, but the one of the prompts around like recognizing when something's not going well, again, not intro, but like middle of the road reflecting on access needs of like, yeah, like I'm, I don't know. I just like tried to listen to this podcast and I don't know what they said in the end. So there's something about that. Is it about auditory processing, auditory processing with processing speed? Is it that I don't have all my other sensory needs met? Is it that like just it's it's but it all starts from something's not going well. And then wondering later when you have access to your cortex, wondering, wondering why. Xander. Hi. Um, yeah, I, I, I was extremely grateful to learn the word access needs. And it's, it's, we, we really have started using a lot in our family, um, starting from the day we heard it because, um, my, uh, my kiddo, um, is, uh, 31 and I'm, I'm 57 and we're both, uh, we're, we're both autistic. Um, and they, they, they go at TikTok speed. I mean, they're <laughs> boom, 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 a lot of, lot of stuff, you know, and I am a turtle and this tapestry behind me is a turtle. Turtle's been my metaphor because that's how I process. I have one thing at a time. I need to go slow and being able to say to my kid, okay, I want to hear what you have to say, but my access needs are getting in the way has really, really helped. And I just want to say thank you for that. It's been a wonderful tool. That is amazing. That's amazing. Right. So you have this now, this, this, this language to describe what's going on. It's not about the other person. It's about me and my access needs. And um, to, to, you know, when, when I'm using that term access needs, um, thanks, Sarah. Um, uh, look at Sarah and Lizzie at the same time answering the question of anything that anyone needs for full and meaningful participation. Um, and, and yeah, this is just, this is what I need in order to be able to show up and participate fully. So when I, when I show up, um, to, the, to, I walk really uh, to the anytime I go into the kitchen where there's other people eating, um, like my child, um, I have headphones in a lot of the time, but we've like ahead of time discussed about like this has nothing to do with you know anything. It's not like somebody in the chat was talking about like I always get feedback and I'm too loud. Yeah, I don't want that narrative to be given. I want the narrative to be like this is about me and my access needs, and my access needs are for quiet, and this is how I'm going to. And I think it's an example of. I, are there ways, are there, are there places where I have agency to meet my own access needs without requiring someone else to change anything about themselves? Sometimes that's, you know, that, that's, that's not possible. Um, most times that's not possible. It's about then zooming out to say, how are we going to negotiate conflicting access needs? Because conflicting access needs are inevitable. And like part of being in relationship, part of being in community with other people is that we have to have a way to negotiate conflicting access needs. And as Steve shares in the chat, access needs takes the onus off the individual, right? This is just, it's, um, it just is, it just is. So speaking of access needs, um, one of the settings um, in, in which many people do not have their access needs met is the workplace. Um, so um, the third week of every month, of course, at Brain Club, we are usually talking about some aspect of neurodivergence and employment. Um, so uh, next week, we'll actually be hearing from um, from a, a panel, I'm almost done doing interviews, then I'll make my make my compilation story of the um, employers who have done the hard work of the unlearning and the relearning of what it is to create workplace environments for people with all types of brains. 
Um, these are the these are employers being recognized in our um, neuro inclusive employment right spotting program that we run here at All Brains Belong. And um, what I really like about about these interviews is that many of the employers um, like are sharing like really cool specific practical advice. Um, it's it's uh, moving beyond the like aspirational you know visions of, 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 of what this would look like, but really like concrete things that they do differently, including, um, from, from folks who themselves are neurodivergent. Um, and, uh, I think, I think it's going to be a good one. Um, so, so thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to, to, to all of you and, and to all of your cats. And I'm going to put a link in the chat. Um, especially um, for those who are new to All Brains Belong and trying to figure it all out. We have this new site, this uh, All Brains Belong. That has like a link to, um, you know, our, our programs, has a link to an informational flyer with all the different things we do and social media and like just different ways of being connected. So if, um, if, if you're new, welcome, we're glad you're here and lots of different ways to get connected. So uh, thank you all. Thank you so much. And we hope to see you next week.